All right, so this is the, the um, more operational experience side of the IPv6 deployment. We were, Lee and I were trying to not overlap, even though our panelists could have easily, and we have one that overlaps. So our first speaker is John Brzezowski. I don't know how to say it. He's the chief IPv6 architect at Comcast. He works closely with Cable Labs on DOCSIS and packet cable specs, which I'm sure is just tons of fun. Anyway, come on, John. Good morning, folks. Uh, so what, what I'd like to do today is, uh, is tell you a little bit about um, some of our real experiences with uh, various IPv6-related technologies as part of our trials. As I'm sure many of you are uh, aware and hopefully recall, we announced earlier this year that we were, that, that we were going to conduct a number of IPv6-related trials. Um, they, many of them are, uh, are actively underway. Uh, we still have a couple um, to kind of get underway, but we're, nonetheless, we're very close on, uh, on kind of having all these different activities in flight. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's important to note, and it's also, you know, we feel it's very important to, to come back and, and share some of that, that, those experiences here with you. So real quick, um, you know, you know, some, some background information here. You know, we started the, the program at Comcast over five years ago. Uh, we've taken a very incremental approach to enabling V6. Uh, today, the entire, the entire backbone is, uh, is capable of V6. Our back office systems have been fully upgraded to support uh, V6. And, uh, and our Nexus network is largely capable of supporting native IP6. And really, the, the, the piece that remains for us is to kind of systematically go through and you know, enable it, perform any, any software upgrades. But from, from a hardware point of view, um, you know, we've, you know, we, you know, we believe we have what we need there to kind of, uh, to kind of take V6 to the, to the next level here. Um, the initial focus of the program, which I believe was actually very important to how it, it, it panned out for us, is that we, we actually focused initially on device management, right? You know, enabling the network and the infrastructure so that we could manage devices using V6. We found that um, after all that work, uh, it was really, you know, at least in our case, uh, there's an incremental opportunity for us to extend that and now start to take V6 to, you know, you guys. Uh, so that's kind of where we are now with these trials, and I'll tell you more about them. Uh, before I do that, a little bit of background, some more background here. So in case anybody wasn't aware, you know, we, we, when I came back here, uh, when we were in San Francisco or, or Austin, we talked about some of the things that we had set up from a portal point of view. We added some, some new sites here, and basically the top two are our portal for, the, uh, for our V6 activities, and the bottom ones are essentially uh, you know, proxied or translated versions of the content that resides on the original versions or, or, the, or the origin versions of those, those sites. Um, one, one very important point to note, um, we, we recently closed the, uh, the registrations for the trials, uh, but prior to doing so, we had over 7,000 people uh, sign up to participate, which uh, we were very happy about. We thought that was uh, a very important data point and uh, hugely relevant to, uh, to our work. So again, background, the, a little bit more, uh, you know, more background here, but uh, you know, again, the, the goal for us was to make sure that our underlying infrastructure was able to support, um, you know, it was parity you know, between V4 and V6. Uh, for us, um, you know, really the, the preference is, you know, it, for the IPv6 to be native um, versus, you know, other types of techniques. Uh, I think we all, you know, understand or very soon will understand more about what some of the, the pros and cons of the different approaches are. But from our point of view, uh, our, you know, our preference is, uh, is to use, to leverage native connectivity to offer, to offer services to folks. Um, and again, you know, one of the one of the main goals of what we're after is to, you know, enable it, uh, you know, again, verify that everything is working as designed and, uh, you know, identify gaps to make sure that, you know, we don't, there, there are no surprises, right? And we think that, that really it's important for everybody who uh, is deploying v 6 to do this sooner rather than later. Uh, these findings are, they're, they're like diamonds in the rough. They're things that you really need to find out now and not a year from now. Um, and of course, you know, that extends into the home. You know, the, the goal for us is to make sure that when we go into, 
uh, you know, we extend services to folks, and we'll talk more about this later, that we understand what the impact in the subscriber domain is going to be, right? We have to make sure that that, you know, our, our goal, one of the, you know, guiding principles of, of the program at Comcast is to make sure that we, that it is seamless, right? So our, our goal is to, is to really actively try and, you know, disrupt or break things. Um, and uh, yeah, so and and what's going to go alongside with that is going is to make sure that in addition to having the infrastructure ready and available, that we have content and services available over V6 as well. So I'll, I'll kind of switch gears a little bit, talk about some of our trials. Um, six to four was something that we had added to our activities after our initial announcement. Uh, we had done some preparation work, uh, you know, in the you know you know the uh, the early spring time frame. Um, that led us to really pay a lot more attention to 64. Um, I won't bore you with a lot of the, you know, the details on what 64 is. I think most everybody in this room knows what it is, but essentially it is you know, the encapsulation of IP6 packets over IP4. Um, it's fairly well known, been around for a while, you know, often gets um, a bum rap um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and I, I've been guilty of offering it the bum rap itself on, on, on occasion as well. So the, the, the deal is for us is, you know, we saw that there was this, you know, enormous amount of opportunity here to really, you know, uh, leverage 6 to 4 to add to the things that we wanted to learn as it relates to IP6. So, um, you know, and, and that's evidenced by, you know, some home routers that have it on by default and support it, many popular operating systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the fact that it's on by default is actually really the, the key point here. Um, and, and, and the real deal, I think, for everybody in the room here is, um, and I think uh, you know, Martin would probably agree with me here, is it's uh, it's out there whether you whether you whether you want to acknowledge it or not, it's happening, right? So you know, you, you might want to think about actually doing something to uh, to to handle that. Uh, you know, we did, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So we basically deployed uh, a handful of Linux-based six-to-four relays. Uh, currently, there are four running. There will be a fifth running uh, here, hopefully in the Atlanta area before the end of the year. Um, and uh, one of the things that we had learned about the, you know, the use of the Linux uh, platform is uh, the very first time we, we went to go turn it up, it was about a 15 minute maintenance window because uh, the kernel panic basically uh, brought everything to a screeching halt for that night. So once we got everything squared away, um, you know, and this was, uh, you know, again, a Linux-based platform. Uh, the actual turn-up of these of these relays was actually very straightforward. There's definitely some tweaks that we had to make for, you know, different uh, client, you know, I guess, you know, client side or home gateway side, six to four implementations. Uh, but after the day is done, it was very, very uh, you know, fairly straightforward. Um, and honestly, the the reduction in latency was substantial, right? It was easily 50%. So the message, you know, from my point of view is, is you know, if you're not if you're not thinking about deploying six four relays, and you have lots of people on your network that have you know equipment that supports it, you might want to revisit that. Um, and and again, it is it is able, you know, it is enabled by default in a lot of places. Um, and one of the things that we did observe, and you know, this is fairly obvious, but as part of enabling the 64, deploying the 64 relays, you know, because they are now on our network, we actually were able to achieve some of our, you know, you know further achieve some of our objectives in that now we had native traffic, more native traffic, a substantial increase in native traffic across our, across our network, which was, which is very important to us. And I think it's, these are things that would be valuable for everybody to, to learn about. So 6RD. Um, a little bit about 6RD, it's, uh, it's very much, um, you know, a, a lot of folks may or may not know that it's, it's you know, similar to 6 to 4, but it offers, a, a, you know, a number of improvements. Um, uh, one of the challenges that we have with 6 to 4 is, is you know, the use of the anycast addresses and, and the fact that there are, are, like, piles of open relays out there that, um, you know, some are, some are managed better than others, but after the day is done, it's part of the reason why uh, it's, it's often uh, frowned upon. But with uh, with 6RD, we have the uh, you know we have a bit more control. You know, I, I provide some information here about you know where you can find information about the draft, and you probably heard about it earlier this morning. Um, again, we're encapsulating v6 packets over over, uh, over v4. 
Um, but the, the, the key benefit, the 6RD, and, and maybe it doesn't apply as much to me, but it may apply to other folks here, is it's really, it was very, fairly straightforward to deploy for us. It's very similar to the 64 relays. And for folks who have challenges in the access network for IPv6 native, uh, it's really something that, you know, you, you ought to take a look at, um, at a bare minimum test, uh, and, and really consider for your, you know, for your v6 deployment program. Um, it is, uh, you know, it, it yielded some of the same benefits that we had, some of the same benefits that we had uh, with 64, and, you know, it helped us to increase the native IP6 traffic across the backbone. Um, but um, one of the things that we did have to do is we had to, we had to really do a lot of work with, you know, the vendors and, and the open source community to, to create or, or have available to us um, the CEs, the pieces that reside in your house. Um, there's a couple things that we had to do to get them out there. Um, we had to do some manual configuration um, and that sort of thing because in our, in our infrastructure and in, in the device themselves, there are some DHCP bits that were not kind of aligning. Um, but you know, in, in, in fairness, I think those things are going to very soon work themselves out. Um, the, huh. Okay. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll kind of quickly jump to the one point about 6RD. The deal here is um, one of the things that you, you, you should note is if you have, uh, if you're going to consider it, and you know, you, the placement and the quantity of your border relays is very important, right? So impacts to geolocation and performance and latency are all things that you need to be aware of. I'll kind of blow through this last slide because I'm, I'm running out of time. So last but not least, one of the things that we are actively working to deploy, and I was kind of hoping that I'd be able to share it here today, is our native IPv6 uh, trial information. This is where you basically have IPv4 just like you have IPv6 today. Um, one thing I will, take a, uh, I will make a note of for you guys here is the vendor collaboration room is running exactly some of the components that we are using as part of our trials. So I'd encourage you to come and check it out. We can tell you more about it. Um, the bottom line for us is we have, um, you know, we, we have, we are actively planning and, and ready to execute on enabling the first batch of native dual stack subscribers where we basically take v4, leave it as is, and we enable IPv6 prefix delegation into our trial users' homes. Um, from a, from a bit, a bit more technical point of view, at a bare minimum, what we'll offer you as part of these trials with native dual stack is uh, there'll be a slash 128 allocated to the WAN interface. And as well, and, and admittedly, it'll be a slash 64 um, allocated to the LAN interface. That's not fixed, but it's 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 where we're going to start with it. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we have on this front is really um, orchestrating all the you know the the software upgrades and the configurations, which is in some cases business as usual. But because it is a bit on the on the bleeding edge here, uh, you know, we're, we're taking a very incremental approach. So last but not least, before I get thrown off here, um, and Kathy gets mad at me. Uh, one of the biggest things that we see still, uh, where we have some some uh, some gaps, is you know content, right? You know we we you know, we have to make sure that everything that we do is part of enabling v6 to people, whether it's trial or in production, that that content grows proportionally, and as it relates to that. So I was very happy to hear a lot of the news from folks, um, you know, on the content side, and I think we need more of it. Um, and at least I know from our point of view, we. Um, you know, we, we need to see that to, to make sure that we can continue to, you know, achieve the goals and objectives of our trials and ultimately do what we need to do to, to take V6 to, 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 to folks like yourself. So I'm going to wrap up now. Um, thank you very much. So next we have Michael Sinatra, who's been a network engineer at UC Berkeley for 13 years, um, including 11 years on the central campus network, and he has some really interesting experiences, and apparently his current fake title of the month is IPv6 Compliance Officer. That just basically means I nag people to make sure that their applications and systems are v6 compliant. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, just some uh, Experiences that research and education institutions, I'm going to call them EDUs for sure, I realize that's a little bit kind of glossing over, but I'm going to call them EDUs are having with deploying IPv6 or more appropriately adopting IPv6. I'm going to give an example of the UC Berkeley wireless network. So I did a little matrix here of IPv6 deployment preparedness at this point along two axes of service enablement and client enablement. And one thing that I want to also point out is a lot of the regional networks, regional RNE networks are sort of down in this area, regional and national RNE networks. 
they're pretty good uh, well off in terms of IPv6. They can provide IPv6 to their clients and, uh, clients, and most of them have enabled IPv6 on their services. So that includes things like um, Magpie Max, CalRen, CanRen, Mornet, Ornet, and uh, the other ones like IPv, um, like uh, Internet2, NLR, and ESNet. So a lot of what we are moving for is sort of a native dual stack type configuration. Uh, that allows us to continue to use the IPv4 address space that we have and provide a more gradual transition to IPv6. We do have enough, most American EDUs, as most people know, have enough IPv4 address space. We're not in big trouble with that. And we do want to adopt IPv6. We want to move forward with IPv6 for the reasons you see here. I'm going to divide the rest of the talk into two pieces. Uh, one piece is going to talk about our experiences in, in adopting IPv6 in a large-scale Wi-Fi wireless network, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our experiences and maybe give a little bit of a bum rap to uh, 6 to 4 a little bit here, uh, just to uh, help John in, um, in, in what he was talking about. So what we, what we did uh, in the past year is we abated an old captive portal system that was end of life and had some problems. It did not support IPv6. And we actually had a big problem with rogue RAs in IPv6 um, being announced in our captive portal system, even though, it didn't, uh, announce, even though it didn't support IPv6. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But what we did is we decided to roll our own captive portal system. We had this big problem with IPv4 address burn rate, because what was happening is people would come onto the network, they would associate with the wireless network, and they would get an IPv4 globally routable address, even though they never used the network and they never authenticated to it. So there was no reason for them to have that address. They just happened to have a mobile device that had a wireless antenna, and it happened to be turned on, and it happened to get the address. So we wanted to get rid of that. And our solution was one-to-one -one NAT. Basically, you get an RFC 1918 address, and then once you authenticate, that gets bound to an IPv4 globally routable address. And based on some of the presentations this morning, you can see a little bit as to why we did that. It actually allowed us to reclaim a lot of address space, but didn't give us all of the problems that you heard about this morning with regard to shared addressing. And that actually has been very helpful for us. It does still give us the, uh, the, uh, the option of going to uh, a many-to-one NAT in case we want to conserve even more address space. It also, once you authenticate, it turns on IPv6 as a bridge. So basically, the captive portal bridges v6 connectivity to you. You get end-to-end -end native v6 if you have dual stack capability. We did have this problem with rogue RAs. I call it rogue RAs. It's probably not a good way to call it. But basically, it is systems that have connection sharing turned on, in some cases unbeknownst to the actual user of that system. And all it needs is a globally routable IPv4 address, or in some cases, even a private IPv4 address. It will create its own 6 to 4 address. Whether it has connectivity to the 6 to 4 network or a 6 to 4 relay router, it will still announce a route saying, I have your IPv6 default here. Send all your IPv6 traffic through me. And what you end up with is a case where your IPv6 traffic is effectively blocked and you have to time out and then fall over to IPv4. Uh, this happens a lot on wireless networks. In some cases, it even happens on conference networks. I'll let you read through this slide, but this is an example of me having to get up at Aaron two years ago and say, hey, somebody's breaking all of our IPv6 connectivity. Please stop. So what we ended up doing with our IPv6 connectivity is not only turning it on natively, which helps to sort of force out some of that bad rogue 6 to 4, the stuff that gets the bum rap, or that causes 6 to 4 in general to get the bum rap, but we also took the router announcement priority field, which has an incredibly granular uh, option of low, medium, and high, and we turned our routers so they would announce RAs with the priority of high. And that would trump all of the other ones that are in the default realm, which is medium. I don't know why anyone would ever use low, because if medium is the default, there's really no reason to use low unless you really don't want people routing through your device. So that actually worked. We actually got the rogue RAs. Some of them still advertise routes. Some of them still advertise addresses. But we got sort of rid of them from actually causing a problem, because everyone uses our default route, which is the correct one. It's the end-to-end -end native IPv6 route. Uh, I'm going to mention a little bit about this later, but the, the, once you have a, a 6 to 4 thing happening on your network, in the best case scenario, you're sending your traffic off to a 6 to 4 relay router. 
usually being routed through someone's laptop, which is doing connection sharing, and that's out there somewhere, and you may not know where that is. A lot of universities now are setting up their own 64 relay routers. That allows them to do a little bit more control over the traffic. They know where it's going, and they can also selectively block IPv6 traffic, making sure they send back ICMPv6 responses so that the traffic will stop and fail over immediately to IPv4, since most operating systems will do that. They won't time out. If they see an IPM, ICMPv6 unreachable, they'll immediately fail over to IPv4. So that's one way to kind of stop that, or another way, I should say, to kind of stop that 6 to 4 stuff from happening if you don't want it to happen. There's some EDUs out there that block IP protocol 41, which is the IPv4 tunnel side of 6 to 4 and other types of tunnels. That's a bad idea because you're dropping traffic on the floor and you're giving no signaling back to the host that their traffic is being blocked on the floor, dropped on the floor, so they have to now time out and go back to IPv4, and that just makes a big mess for the client. I'll let you read through this slide. There's not really much to it other than this is sort of some of our experiences in running our own sort of six to four relays. Sometimes you've had universities which try to leak their routes to their offsite providers. Sometimes the offsite provider happens to be somebody big uh, like Comcast or someone else, and then you end up sucking in a lot more six to four traffic than you thought you were. So Comcast, of course, has been very nice in setting up their own six to four relays, and that's helped out a lot um, to give us you know, a little bit more symmetry in the 6 to 4 traffic that we are actually sourcing. I'm not going to talk too much about this part. I'm going to try to get through it so we have time for questions. Um, this is actually wrong. It should be broken APs, not broken RAs. And all I'll say about this is we did have a set of, RA, of, of APs that had a very, very good implementation of RA guard. Now, a lot of us here at uh, the EDU community, we like something like RA guard because if we... Um, if we, have, if we have RAs that are maliciously out there, which we haven't yet had, they're all misconfigurations, but if we have rogue RA announcements that are maliciously coming in and they d decide to set their route priority to high, that could actually start capturing some of our traffic. So what we like are access points that only, and switches that only allow RA announcements from a designated port, which is where the upstream router is. That's very similar to DHCP snooping. So it's basically R DHCP snooping for RAs, and there's already an internet draft out about this. Uh, these particular devices were so robust in their RA guard capability that they actually blocked all IPv6 traffic from the client, and they allowed all IPv6 traffic from the router, so that just broke IPv6 connectivity for all the clients, but gave them nice, shiny, globally routable IPv6 addresses, which they would try to use. Some of us are also even putting up some Teredo relays. Um, I thought this is going to be really not very interesting because you're not going to find much happening in Teredo because Teredo is supposed to be used as an absolute last resort if there's no IPv4 connectivity out there. Well, it turns out during breaks, during this meeting, I said, oh, I'm just going to set up a Teredo re relay on Berkeley's campus and, and start sucking in the Teredo routes and see what happens. And I'm now seeing with our native wireless network that we've set up, I'm now seeing a lot of peer-to-peer, -peer, what looks like peer-to-peer -peer traffic. I don't really know what it is, but I'm actually seeing a fair amount of traffic going through Teredo. So that's kind of interesting. That's not something I expected to happen. Um, but it is interesting the kinds of things you learn about what's going on in your network when you have these relays that you set up, the 6 to 4 relays and the Teredo relays. So that's basically it. In conclusion, dual stack is not dead. A lot of us here in the EDU community are still trying to do dual stack, sometimes with some sort of IPv4 NAT augmentation like we did with our wireless network. In some cases, we're just doing straight native dual stack, which is what a lot of us are doing in our residential networks at this point. And Berkeley's hoping to do that. We have some management tools that we have to fix, but we'll get, we'll get uh, v6 in our residential network, I hope, this year. And um, for the most part, the transition mechanisms, we're actually trying to sort of keep those out. So 6 to 4 and Trado, we're tr trying to get a handle on what's happening with them, trying to get some control over them, and trying to get them replaced with native dual stack. Thanks. And next up, we have Tom Kof Kofin. I've never said it before. He's a self-defined router lackey, and he's been working at Limelight Network since 2006 as a network engineer. Well, thanks, Kevin. Hello. Um, I realized I did not put a background slide in here, so for those that aren't familiar with what uh, Limelight has endeavored to do over the last couple of years in the IPv6 space, I'll briefly run over um, our efforts there. Uh, our initiative started uh, in the core of our network, um, and I guess I should back up and point out, for those that uh, aren't aware, 
Limelight is somewhat unique as a CDN as it has its own uh, core network um, modeled very much after a traditional service provider uh, IP backbone uh, where you expect to see and, and do see the traditional elements, uh, architectural elements that are present in that, that setup. So um, we started out our initiative with uh, what we consider to be perhaps the, the easiest portion of the IPv6 adoption process, which is getting IPv6 in the core. Uh, that started in around the middle of 2008, and by the end of 2008, we had uh, v6 in the core, and we're routing IPv6 traffic. Um, over the next few months, in the beginning of 2009, we started bringing up uh, v6 transit sessions to those transit providers that offered v6 routes, um, as well as uh, a significant, a relatively significant amount of V6 peering, uh, considering what was available for the time. Um, all of this uh, work in the core um, was then followed up by uh, enough edge work to culminate in um, a proof of concept demo with Netflix, where we were able to deliver Netflix Watch It Now traffic over V6, and this is a service that's uh, still up and running today. Um, so getting to that point, we had uh, what are probably traditional concerns in the, in, the, in, in the IPv6 adoption process for anybody in the room, which is uh, primarily ma maintaining stability in the existing production network. Um, and we endeavored to do that by uh, trying to carefully select what, what routing protocols we were going to use and, and uh, carefully making sure that our, our existing edge architecture um, was primed to support uh, whatever mechanisms we had to put in place to deliver v6 traffic. Uh, we, we were mostly successful in that. We ran into some bumps and I've got here on the first slide uh, a basic breakdown of, of some of the architectural and organizational challenges that we face. So I'll talk about the, ar the architectural ones first. Um, one of the, the bumps that we ran into was in the process of selecting a routing protocol. Uh, at the time our vendor um, only offered uh, a single topology mode of ISIS. Uh, because we were using uh, ISIS in the IPv4 domain, um, there was a lot of uh, interest and uh, determination to, to make sure that we leveraged our, our, our knowledge and experience with ISIS in the v6 domain as well. So the, the, the trick there is that in single topology mode, there's, there's a single SPF calculated for both v4 and v6. So in a v4 production network, you, you can definitely run into some turbulence if uh, if your addressing schemes aren't correct on interfaces and SPF recalculations uh, occur. So <clears throat> we, we got off fairly easy. We, you know, there were a couple of events where there was some turbulence on the network as a result of that. And uh, now um, the vendor has finally caught up to providing dual topology mode ISIS, which um, it, it leaves one in, you know, for myself, it's kind of like, well, thanks, I could have used that two years ago, but, you know, now that we're already uh, completely integrated into single topology ISIS, it, it, it makes a, a difficult uh, proposition to think about transitioning into dual topology and, and go through a lot of the same challenges and struggles that we went through in the first place with uh, selecting the IGP. So, and that, that falls under the general category of, of dealing with vendor readiness. Um, So one thing that we get, I mean, we continue to run into issues uh, with vendor readiness on, on, uh, on, on the network side and on the core side. Uh, one issue in particular that, that may be of interest to some folks is um, line cards that, uh, that have CAM space for both, both IPv4 and IPv6 space, um, or IPv6, IPv4 and IPv6 routes. Uh, we've run into an instance where we have uh, CAM space divided up to give us 384K V4 routes and 128K V6 routes for a total of 512K routes in the CAM. Uh, and that's, that's obviously problematic uh, from a core service provider network stand, uh, standpoint if you're routing V4 traffic and you've got the table which currently, the V4 table which currently sits at around 330K routes approximately um, and you realize that you've only got headroom of about 50K more routes on the V4 side and then add to that that you've got uh, V6 um, prefix uh, CAM allocation for 128K V6 routes, which seems quite like overkill if, if we do V6 correctly and, and leverage the, uh, the aggregation um, promise that it offers. 
So uh, that's something that we're, you know, just an example of an issue that, you know, we continue to face uh, even as we go forward with, uh, you know, with our, our vendor of choice. Where we're trying to get to, um, let me jump ahead here. There are organizational challenges as well, and, and I'll briefly go over some of the ones that, that we faced internally. And, and these are not unique. I'm sure a lot of folks here who are, who are dealing with the IPv6 adoption challenge have, uh, have run into the same, some of the same issues. Um, we're lucky at Limelight. We're very forward-leaning. We have to be in the CDN space. It's, it's very focused on, uh, on evolution and adapting to you know, the emerging Internet environment um, to deliver services and, and to make money off delivering those services. Uh, so, you know, management buy-off uh, was never really the problem. I mean, I think we had a, a commitment from, from the highest levels of the organization uh, very early that, that we would do V6 and we would, uh, you know, we would, we would lead in that space. Um, but what we find out is that uh, management buy-off and uh, allocation of resources are not necessarily the same thing. And, and I know that, you know, every organization struggles with this. It's, you, you, you only have uh, so many hours in the day and so many personnel to, to tackle, uh, tackle initiatives. And so part of the issue is that, um, you know, what we're all witnessing in terms of the lack of content available in V6 um, by virtue of some of the technical challenges that we face uh, makes it difficult to make a business case uh, that would then alloc that would then align resources to in the organization to deploy v6 um, in a much more rapid way uh, so that that continues to be a challenge and, and that's something that uh, that I, I'm sure that you know we'll, we'll continue to see as as a challenge so for us it's really about uh, internally in our organization getting IPv6 you know having in folks in the organization who are IPv6 evangelists and, and getting them uh, to carry the message to the various parts of the organization that the, the, this, this challenge is not going to go away. You, you can't ignore, um, you know, the fact that uh, that we're going to have uh, turbulence in delivering v4 services based on on address exhaustion. And what we're after at Limelight is quite simply just parity between everything that we offer in the v, v4 space and and being able to make sure that that functions in a v6 environment. A v6 v4 environment with uh, you know something like carrier grade NAT in the middle or any combination uh, thereof. So, and then finally, um, as part of that, it really what um, what I'd like to accomplish uh, this year organizationally at Limelight is to to really uh, pin down where the demand is and isn't from customers. Um, I know a lot of customers know that they should care about v6. They've been told that. They've read it. Uh, they've heard it apocryphally, but they may not necessarily be feeling the pain yet of not being able to deliver v6 traffic. In fact, you know, we're pretty much sure that they're not. Um, and when we do get inquiries, you know, we, we definitely try to lead that dance with customers and, and make them aware of, of the, uh, the emerging challenges that are coming from v4 exhaustion if they're not already aware of them. Um, what we'd like to find out is is what drives their interest and and or lack of interest in, in v6 adoption uh, and and try to try to build a you know a, a, a useful database for extracting wh where to best focus the energies in the organization to to make v6 happen in in the best and fastest way possible for you know for our critical customers and for the services that they want to deliver so that continues to be a challenge, and I'm sure it's something that we'll, we'll continue to work on this year. And uh, that's about all I have. So thank you very much. Next up, we have Lorenzo Clidi from um, Networking at Google. Um, he got to write his um, master's thesis on IPv6 and IPv4 tunnel discovery in the internet. Sounds pretty exciting. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we've done and uh, what we've found to work and what um, doesn't. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, um, we've been doing IPv6 for a while. Um, we started in mid-2007, really. We, we started with some network engineering and, and um, software engineering. And in about a year and a half, we brought v6 to most of our major services, and they're available uh, in the Google over IPv6 program. Um, so. Um, 
it um, it didn't took it didn't take that much work to um, to actually do this. It was with a small team. Um, the strategy was to take a gradual approach. The idea is that if you do it in a hurry, it's going to cost you a lot of money. You're going to have you might actually have to end up forklifting hardware, and we just didn't want to do that. So um, we took a very very uh, slow and measured approach. We had you know a handful of people or even less just uh, slowly chipping away. Uh, we got V6 into the requirements, and when we when we changed our hardware. Um, and when vendors approached us saying, oh, we have this great new product that does v6, we said, okay, not interested. Um, but to vendors that said, we don't support IPv6, we said, okay, well, we're not going to buy from you uh, unless you do. Right? So, um, so we worked from the outside in. Um, when we started, there was basically nothing else out there uh, of, of any size. So what we did was we started with user-facing services and we made them available, starting with ipv6.google.com. Um, you know, starting just at the load balancer and then progressively going up the software stacks until we reach the applications. Um, and, and, and that was essential to actually get some user traffic and, 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 and make the software developers understand that this thing was real and that this traffic was coming in. And, and it gave us a source of traffic that we could use to actually um, um, run our services on. Um, so we use a shim layer to protect our applications. We basically take the v6 address, strip off the user modifiable bits, and hash it into multicast space, um, uh, which um, is something that really enabled us to advance without having all of our code, all of our applications, all our systems understand v6. Um, this has a few um, undesirable properties, notably it breaks geolocation, um, but it really is uh, one of the key things that allowed us to make progress. Sometimes it's not perfect. Um, at one point, Gmail was telling you, your last login is from um, this multicast v4 address. So on a network design, what we found to work is to make it as similar to v4 as possible. That way you don't, you don't have to retrain your knock, you don't have to uh, do anything, and, and, and dual stack everything you can, because if you dual stack it, it's going to scale by itself, it's operationally supported. Um, so for example, if you're using, you know, it, it's probably best if you use one protocol, one IGP, um, that's what we chose to do, you're using ISIS, and you're using, you know, single topology, ISIS for everything. Um, uh, we use v4 to carry v4 and v6 to carry v6. We don't want fade sharing between protocols. We want things to blow up independently if they blow up. And we found this to be um, very useful. Um, and implementations, yes. So they mostly kind of work. They mostly kind of say what they do, but they have bugs because the, nobody's ever really kicked the tires. And so don't expect stuff to work just because it's supported, uh, because it's likely, it's likely that nobody else has used it before you. So, you know, put it in a lab, test it, um, and when you find the bug, don't stop testing. Don't wait for the vendor code maintenance release to fix it. Find the next bug, because I guarantee you that it's there. And so, repeat, rinse and repeat. There are many more bugs to find, and you don't have time to fix them one by one. Uh, and what we did, what we found to be useful is that if you can produce a, wor a workaround that's actually acceptable for production, then put it into production because the bugs are really hard to find, you can only find them in production. So for example, I mean, these are choice examples of bugs. Um, if a firewall filter term has a one-bit match in bits 32 to 64 and then a two-bit match in bits 64 to 96 on this particular platform in this code release, then it's not going to work. Now, I challenge you to find that in your lab. Um, in uh, the fib and rib get out of sync in particular race conditions and particular combinations of root, root updates. This may be a little bit easier, but you know it's hard to find. Uh, duplicate address detection uh, is, is, is kind of a you know medium-sized headache. Um, on our vendor, you basically have to de deactivate the interface configuration and put it back um, when you trigger that, and that's uh, that's a problem, right? So we ended up disabling it. So. Again, are you going to find this in the lab? Maybe, but maybe not. So what's not working? So, so our infrastructure is basically um, pretty stable at this point. Uh, we're able to, to offer most of the services. Now it's in, including YouTube. Now it's an incremental you know, business of bringing it to the services that don't yet have it, and, and sort of it's a slow, um, so it's slow progress now. Um, but what's broken is, is, is um, the rest of the internet. In particular, we see a lot of brokenness in, in, in homes. Um, what happens is that typically operating systems will try IPv6 first, and then they'll fall back to v4. Uh, but in some cases, um, the fallback to v4 will be slow. Um, typically, if the host tries v6 and it doesn't have a default root, doesn't have a v6 address, it'll just fail instantly, and that's fine. It'll just fall back, try the next address, go on with life. That's fast. It's not a problem. Um, if there's a network error, uh, for example, you know the, the router 
advertises v6 reachability or but doesn't actually forward the packets or replies with unreachables what happens is that the host just sits there trying to connect to the v6 address sits there for four seconds or 20 seconds on the windows just sits there saying oh i'm trying to connect i'm trying to connect i'm trying to connect and then uh, the, the throbber is just spinning and nothing's happening uh, and so um you know various failure scenarios I mean, that on linux it's three minutes if you don't send unreachables it's it's particularly bad mtu holds are very bad um and a lot of this is due to home gateway behavior. I mean, certain models of home gateways have been known to turn on 64 with a private IPv4 address on the, on the, on the WAN side. Um, nobody explained to them that this is impossible. This is never going to work. Um, but you, it's turned on by default. You can't disable it. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and even if you have both native and 64 in your home, your host might end up using 64 because it's just going to pick the first root advertisement that it uh, chooses. And this will break things. Um, so, another thing, hosts may choose to prefer 64 over IPv4. Well, guess what? V4 is more reliable because 64 is at best as reliable as V4. Um, and so uh, this was a known issue in RFC 3484. Most application developers have worked around it. Windows worked around it. Um, Opera worked around it, had, their, had this problem. Uh, the Mac is now working around it. Um, we, expect those, um, we expect those fixes to roll very soon. Uh, and then there's broken firewalls. There's, there's all sorts of things. And basically, again, it's nobody's ever really kicked the tires. There's a very, very low level of background noise. This is my favorite. It's, um, it's um, don't look at the MAC addresses. I didn't scrub them out. But it's um, a home gateway advertising v6 reachability and telling the hosts on the local net that they have a prefix of 0000 slash 64. That, that's brilliant in itself. It's not a unicast address. If I were the OS implementation, I wouldn't accept such a prefix. But the um, uh, OS accepts the prefix of 0000, and it tries to connect. And the uh, router sends back, no, you don't have a root, unreachable. And the OS just keeps trying. And after four seconds, it, um, it gives up for the first address. And there's five more addresses to try. So it just you know, waits for 24 seconds. And this is completely broken in, in, all, part, in all parts of it. But this is, we saw this in real life, and a user had this issue. Um, so we have some numbers of this. We use a variant of um, the JavaScript experiment that the various other people are using. Uh, we have a decently sized data set. Um, but there's a lot of noise in the data, and we're not exactly sure. There's, there's a lot of different effects in there that may contribute. Um, if you filter out the data and you only look at stuff that's very clean, that we know exactly what's going on, these are the numbers. So for the internet, it's, it's gone down from 0.09%. Um, 0.082, something like that. Um, and so the other, other numbers are similar. Um, we have a blind spot for whitelist ISPs, people that are going to the Google over IPv6 program. Um, so um, for them, if they have broken v6, they can't reach us, and therefore we can't measure that. We plan to fix this by putting measurements on a host that's not part of the Google over IPv6 program, host without a v6 address on other networks. So we can actually measure that as well. And um, so uh, the good news is if, if you take away Mac, um, if you sort of exclude it from the results, um, you get into 4.9's territory, which isn't too bad. Um, it's, still, uh, it's still the kind of level of uh, reliability that, that the people you know, that need to make this call are kind of uncomfortable with. But it's better than three than, than three nines or, or three and a half that you'd have, you know, if you if you can serve the Mac. And you know, as the fixes roll, we'll see how fast they roll out. We'll see what the numbers uh, are looking like over time. Um, but again, there is persistent low-level brokenness. The only way to fix this really is is in the OS stack because the home gateways never get upgraded. You know, they often there aren't firmware upgrades available for them. Nobody upgrades their home router. They don't know what the problem is. And even you know when they see this problem, what happens is, oh, Google is down. That's funny, huh? It's down all the time for me now. I wonder what that is. But you know, Facebook, Yahoo, Bing, they all work. So probably it's a Google problem. You know, they did something wrong. But I can't call Google because I don't know who to call. And so one of the things we were thinking about um, with other content providers is to dec declare a, a quad A day, uh, in which you know major content providers would get together and agree to um, provide quad A's to the whole internet for one day, turn it on, leave it on, and turn it off. And the goal of that would be to get the user who has such a setup 
which is malfunctioning all around, which is broken, to call their ISP. And their ISP would know who they are and would say, okay, you have this problem, turn off v6. And, you know, that's fine. They turn off v6, the, 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 the 0. You know, 0 0.05 percent of users with this problem disable v6, fix the problem, and the rest of the, the internet, you know, the other 99.9 .9 percent which doesn't have this problem, can turn on v6 or leave it off, it doesn't matter, but it doesn't block other people who want to use v6 from using it. So that's what doesn't work. Hopefully we'll, um, you know, the Mac fixes and the Quad A will help, uh, but, you know, if you have other ideas on how to find these people, and once you've found them, how to report them to their ISP, because our privacy policy doesn't allow it, don't know about yours. If you have any ideas, you know, let us know. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to switch gears ever so slightly, and um, Jason's going to come back up. There's an internet draft that he and some other folks wrote that I thought was particularly applicable to this community and address space, so I wanted to have him present it. So here's Jason from um, Cox Communications again. Thanks. All right, just so I don't come off as the knack guy of, of, of Cox, uh, I do wanted to quickly go over the fact that um, uh, it, since this is a panel for V6 adoption and, I mean, and transition, uh, just to clear, point out the fact that we are actually doing transition as well, and like 80% of my job is actually working with the uh, engineering and, and operations teams to actually uh, push native V6 out to the, uh, the home user. So, and just to give you a quick, uh, overview there is 2009 we started rolling out on the backbone that's been completed we're now turning up uh, every peering session we can this year uh, now pushing out into the systems hope to have every system online by the end of the year and then start uh, uh, cable modem trials obviously we're a few years behind uh, John so we've been playing catch up ever since <laughs> and I'm sure uh, he'll hear some uh, nice IM blow ups uh, in the next few months as we stumble across some of the challenges that he's already uh, run through all right, so what we're doing here is, um, what, so one of the transition technologies I already talked about today was uh, LSN, uh, Service Provider NAT 4.4. There's also uh, 6RD. Both of these, in, including other transition technologies, uh, clearly benefit from a, a shared address space. So what we're doing in the ITF is uh, asking for a single block of address space to be used for that purpose. Um, so I'll do a quick history lesson, uh, problem statement and solution, try to save some time for questions. Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions uh, for this whole se uh, session here. All right, so real quick, um, uh, history lesson, NCP to IPv4 happened in uh, 81. Uh, basically the goal here was a, a flash cut, which resulted in you know, the internet, be well, the network being broken for, for a few months. Um, flat, flash forward now, now we're transitioning from v4 to v6. Um, obviously, we can't turn off the network for, for a few months. That's not really practical. So, hence all the transition mechanisms we've been talking about all morning. All right, so the overview of the problem statement. Uh, obviously, IPv4 exhaustion is imminent. Uh, you know, it's arguable whether it's going to happen in Q1, Q2, Q3. This is the average of, the, of those. Uh, the deployment is obviously... Uh, IPv6 only deployment is not really an option at this point. V6 dual stack, at least in my viewpoint, is the only option to go. Um, and primarily the, the things I talked about this morning, CE devices aren't, aren't V6 enabled today and it's going to take us a few years to get there. Um, and so the overall takeaway there is providers must do something. Um, obviously we've already talked about, about today, D, uh, 6RD, DS Lite, uh, large scale NAT. Those are the things that we're going to be rolling out, at least to get us through the interim point while we're doing v6 native as well. And then the other problem that some of the large providers are having is we're running out of RC 1918 space or we have run out, which makes these uh, transition technologies even more of a challenge to deploy. So uh, Marla Azinger and Leo Vagoda did a good draft, uh, I believe a few IETFs ago, it's going through last call, that said, hey, what is it if, we're, if we need shared address space for multiple transition technologies and to get us through this tr coexistence period, what are the options available? Uh, some of them are the, whoop, the 240 slash 4 space, uh, the reserve space. Some of the challenges there that we've already run into are some of the uh, home gateways 
And so this, what we're talking about here is uh, shared address space to be used in the provider network, not, not out large on the internet. So it is going to look like private address space internally to, to the service provider or, or large enterprise network. Uh, some of the other options were to redefine a uh, user uh, private space that hasn't been allocated already, so that's kind of what this, uh, this draft is, going, is seeking to do. Uh, another option is for operators to come together and say, hey, I got a piece of this space that I'll dedicate to this cause, and this operator has another piece, and we'll all get together and come up with you know, a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand blocks that we can all use internally to our networks and not route out. Uh, obviously, that has some operational considerations and is not uh, the best case, at least in our viewpoint. And the other option is just uh, do nothing and, and squat on space, which is another option that uh, is being talked about in, in, some, in some networks. So the recommended use is basically the least uh, crappy of all these approaches. Uh, it's basically to use, to just go ahead and take part of the address space that's out there that isn't allocated today and dedicate it for coexistence transition technology usage. Uh, benefits, a couple of them are it's the most predictable uh, outcome. Uh, we don't have to run through a lot of the uh, operational challenges we'd have to with the others. Uh, it, it, in, our, in our viewpoint, it does offer the best customer experience because it's the least amount of development. Obviously, there's still development needed, but uh, it's, it's the one that we think we can get through uh, most efficiently. And it does allow operators to, to focus on IPv6 deployment above all else because obviously um, we don't want to be sitting here running v4 10 years from now, even though I'm sure it will be little pieces of it out there somewhere, but obviously v6 is the way to go for uh, for native uh, internet usage. All right, so what is this? Uh, real quick, uh, this is pull, the definition is pulled from the draft. Uh, it's basically reserved address space that can be used internally to large service providers or, uh, or large enterprises for the purpose of uh, facilitating V6 transition or coexistence. Uh, the recommended usage is it should not be used, it should only be used between the CGN or LSN or SPNAT, whatever you want to call it and then the uh, CPE router in that address space. Um, and it should not be used at home networks because obviously that would, the whole point of using shared address space is that you're not overlapping with uh, internal private space within the uh, home networks. Uh, some of the benefits, uh, flexibility. So it's useful for both um, not overlapping internally. It's also useful for people that are running out of RFC 1918 space as well. Allows a uh, transition uh, and my overall view is it allows you to actually deploy native v4, v6 for until v6 catches up. So, listen, this is this is Jason talking, not Cox. But if you have native v6, v4, using Darwin's theory and, and the fact that operating systems are skewed to actually uh, select v6 over v4, at some point when all the content catches up, and uh, you'll see traffic uh, rise to the point of critical threshold. You're going to see that whole migration take place, and then you can slowly phase out v4 from your, from your network. Uh, and then the other thing is security. So having one block to uh, Apple from the edge is definitely beneficial. And then this is some supporters we've had for the draft. Um, it's had some interesting uh, comments with it. And actually, this is the O2 version, so it's already on, on, the, third, on the third version. Uh, so we've incorporated a lot of the, com the comments we've already heard. Um, good feedback from uh, operator community as well as uh, vendors. It's interesting, most of the vendors are against us, but it seems that most of the operators are for us, so I'm not sure what, what, how you read into that, but it's kind of interesting. And obviously time is of the essence. If we're talking about uh, Q2 of, is when IANA is gone, obviously it doesn't make sense to talk about this in 2013. <laughs> That'll do it. And these are the uh, links to uh, some of the drafts. And th this is actually the third version of this draft. There's also uh, NTT has a draft, a Shurasaki uh, draft, that has the address base just for NAT44. Uh, this tries to be more flexible and say it could be used for any of the transition technologies as well as any of your coexistence technologies. And that's it. So we have a, we have five minutes. So does anyone have any questions? I've been told then we get the big hook. Go ahead. Hooked. Um, hey guys, Marty Hennigan from Akamai. Um, a little scratchy. I got some allergies today, but uh, 
two things I, I think that um, with respect to content networks catching up, I think you just actually don't know where we are. Um, we're kind of in lockstep whether you know it or not. Um, we're going to talk more about that as the months progress and I think you'll see some thought leadership come from us um, with respect to V6 transition. Second, with the customer perception that customers don't want it, they don't need it, I think that, so, over the past few weeks I live in Cambridge and uh, I go to Harvard Square a lot, I like it around there, and every now and then I'll just kind of walk up to someone and say, are you ready for IPv6? And they go, what the hell are you talking about? Okay. So, I think that from the cable and uh, end user network perspective that it's supposed to be transparent to the users. And from the content perspective, I think it's supposed to be transparent to the users. I don't think that um, unless we break it, you'll hear a lot from customers and end users. So um, I'm not waiting around for customers to ask me for it. Um, we'll be ready. Um, they'll be able to use it. Um, the, big, the big, big thing with moving to V6, and this is a personal opinion, and I think it's probably an industry perspective as well, is that it has to be as good as V4. We cannot break the internet. We cannot make the service worse. We have to make it equal or better. I'm hoping that it's going to be better. Um, okay, we only have five minutes. Okay, for hold on. So. I'm not done. We're a big, important part of the industry. Um, if you look in the routing table, you'll see that we have lots of E6 space out there. And if I haven't already contacted you or you haven't contacted me with respect to dual stacking, every single connection that we have, see me after the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Suzanne? Suzanne Wolf, ISC. Um, I'm looking around and I see mostly big folks on, the, on the, the, the panels we've done this morning. I just want to reinforce the point that this is stuff that the little guys and the medium-sized guys need to care about also. Um, sort of the, the, you guys need to be looking at this if you want your network to continue to grow. Um, and there's lots of experience beginning to be out there. There's lots of technology. Um, obligatory plug, ISC does open source implementations of some of these things. Um, we've done a dual stack light. Check that out. Um, we're doing DNS 6.4. There are other open source implementations that don't cost you anything to try out. Go kick the tires. Talk to Lorenzo and Marty and everybody else. But this is not just something that worries the big guys. That, that's exactly the point of these panels. Thanks, Suzanne. Front mic. Just a, Who are you? I'm nobody. I'm <laughs> Scott Shepard, um, who asks silly questions. Uh, one, in the earlier talks today, someone mentioned something about law enforcement, FBI, all that sort of thing, uh, trying to do warrants, intercepts, that sort of thing. And you're saying you have to report decent timestamps, date, time, uh, source port information. Uh, has anyone here actually worked with law enforcement to deal with some of the problems associated with carrier grade NAT and all this other stuff and saying, FBI, you've got to give me this information? Is there any practical experience working with these folks, yes. standards bodies, any of that sort of thing? Do any of you guys want to answer? The, uh, so this is uh, John Brzezowski. The only thing that I could offer you is, um, is uh, from, a, from a V6 point of view, we recently received the request, our first two this year, for uh, legal response for V6 addresses. Um, I think you're asking something a little bit different about perhaps, you know. This is, okay, this is in, in the right track as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought that was, I thought that was great, a great sign of things. I mean, the fact that we were asked those sort of questions and we had in, internal people who had to go respond to this sort of things and um, that was huge. I, I was surprised, but pleasantly surprised. So that was cool. Anybody else really quick? Well, there is, there's also a, um, Aaron does have a government working group and we are starting to work uh, more closely with, in that group to try to point out some of these issues as well. On uh, West George from Sprint, I were at the re most recent one. And uh, Bobby Flame, I'm not sure if he's here, but he's kind of driving that out as well. So. Thank you. I'll follow up with you later. Thanks a lot, you guys. That was great.